and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very honored to chair this meeting this morning um, for uh, our talk from Gidon El Azar on being Jewish in China, the current situation of the Kaifeng Jews. Um, I think it's fair to say that I've known Gidon all his life. And any resemblance between Gidon and Daniel Elazar in the picture is not coincidental. Uh, Gidon is a doctoral student in East Asian Department, East Asian Department at Haifa University. He has spent several years in China studying Chinese and conducting anthropological research in the southwestern province of Yunnan. His doctoral research deals with the current activities in, of Christian missionaries in Yunnan and the relationship between religion, ethnicity, and state policy in the increasingly globalized China. I just asked Gidon uh, when he's submitting his PhD, so he said he remembers that 10 years ago, uh, the Americans said, this is our last year in, Ch in, in Afghanistan. And they've been saying that every year for the last 10 years. So. And on that note, I pass the microphone. Okay. First of all, it's, uh, I'm happy to be here. It's uh, an honor to be back in this library where I worked for a year, actually. I uh, worked here as a librarian. It's nice to... I'm saying I worked here as a librarian, so it's nice to uh, be back in this library on this wall this time. Uh, used to sit over there. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, about the Jews of Kaifeng. Um, try and um, give some historical background first. Give you a little bit of the uh, of a concept of how they got there and how they uh, stayed there. And uh, then, kind of part two will be what uh, what what there is there today and. How we can understand something about uh, about uh, the uh, existence of uh, Judaism there in China in the Chinese in the context of contemporary China, Reform Era China, what we call post Maoist China. Um, so let let's start with a little bit of background, a little bit of history of Um So uh, this is not really can't really see it very well, uh, unfortunately. Ah, uh, yeah. Let's Okay, there you go. Uh, this is a very famous scroll. The reason I'm opening with this is because this is a very famous scroll of Kaifeng. This is a, a picture of a painting of Kaifeng from around the era where uh, when the uh, Jews got out there, the Song. A number of Jewish communities in China. We know from Marco Polo that there were communities uh, in other places in China, in Hangzhou, and other places. But surprisingly, the only community that survived uh, was the community of Kaifeng. We'll try and. Uh, there's really no way of knowing why, but uh, I'll try and theorize a little bit about why, why exactly uh, they they survived. Uh, in 1163, uh, the synagogue was established. We have here the here the uh, this is the the these are the steels um, where the uh, the arrival of the Jews is documented. This, there's uh, Kind of a history of the of Jewish history from Abraham through Ezra. Uh, this is this, these steels exist in the Kaifeng Museum. I'll talk about them later. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on the on uh, on the ancient history. Just, just to say, this is with the things that the the steels express um, loyalty to the uh, emperor, uh, and uh, like all religions in China. They uh, tr uh, try and show how Judaism is compatible with, with the Confucian tradition. And uh, these are the, the prized uh, artifacts of the community. As I will show later, there's actually almost nothing left. And th these, this is almost the only thing that is left in Kaifeng. They're kept in the museum, in the Municipal Museum of Kaifeng. I want to... I'd like to jump forward a little bit. Uh, I should say the Jewish community in Kaifeng was never very large. 
um, or particularly important. Really, the only reason that uh, it's caused so much interest is because of its exotic. Uh, it's because it's because of it being so far away from, you know, being at the edge of of, of the world from a Jewish perspective. Um, and what happened is that in the in the late 14th century, the Silk Route was closed. Uh, as a result, the Mongolians, who were the uh, those who maintained the, the Silk Route, uh, were kicked out of China. A new dynasty came, the Ming Dynasty. And the Ming Dynasty gradually closed China for all kinds of reasons we won't go into today. And so basically the Kaifeng Jews were detached from the Jewish world for hundreds and hundreds of years. Nobody knew about them. Uh, we don't find any references to them in any Jewish texts. Um, the, as far as I know, maybe somebody who knows better can correct me, but as far as I know, nobody knew about them. The person who discovered them in 1605, and I, I want to tell you the story because I think it says a lot about the, conf the, the community, is this guy, Matteo Ricci. He was a very famous Jesuit missionary, the first Jesuit missionary to China. Um, was responsible for translating a lot of the Confucian texts. He was also the one who, co who coined the term Confucius. If you ever wondered why the, he has a Latin name, it's because the Jesuits, um, Latin sounding name, it's because the Jesuits tried to bring Confucianism to the West. It's a long story, won't go into it now. But he was a very important guy. And in 1605, he was in Beijing. And he had a visitor, a guy by the name of Ai Tian, who was from the city of Kaifeng. Ai Tian had had come to Beijing to do to to participate in the official examination. I don't know if you are aware of the fact in, throughout the centuries in China, people who wanted to uh, move up the ranks, who wanted to become clerks, had to go through an examination. There was a series of examinations. The examination was on the Confucian classics. He, this, uh, this guy, Ai Tian, was coming to take the highest level of uh, examination, the Jian Shi. And he uh, had heard that, in, that there's a man in town who claims he believes in one god. Um, and that he's, he claims that he's not a Muslim. The Jews knew very well about Islam. Islam arrived in, in uh, China around the 8th century, a little earlier, uh, and the Jews uh, were very well aware of Islam also because from a Chinese perspective, uh, Islam and, and uh, Judaism were very, very similar, and they had to, in fact, the Jews were called the those who do not eat the sinews. That was one of their, their early, their early name was, was a reference to the Gida Nashe, because uh, as kind of a way of differentiating that between them and the and the Muslims, you know, from a Chinese pers perspective, one God, no pork, basically the same, kind of couldn't really differentiate between Islam and Judaism. It was the Jews, as we'll see later, it actually, it, it, the the net, the need to differentiate between them and, and Muslims brought some ironic consequences. We'll get to that a little later. Um, when Ai Tian heard that this man who was a monotheist was sitting in Beijing, he, of course, assumed that he was Jewish. He went to see him. And he, as he entered Ricci's, Ricci's room, Ricci, and, he, and identified his, himself as a, a believer in, in one God, Ricci was very excited because he himself was on his quest to look for uh, Nestorians. Nestorians, the Nestorian church was an, was an ancient church that had come from the Middle East to China and to Mongolia. Uh, and had had some success uh, at a certain point, uh, but had disappeared. By the time the Jesuits arrived in China, the Nestorians had disappeared. We knew about, he knew about them because Marco Polo wrote about them, and others had written about meeting Nestorians, but Ricci had never met any Nestorians. So they, in fact, both people, as they kind of stood in front of each other, were convinced that they had found long-lost brothers. Ricci took him into his, to the prayer room, there was a picture of, of Mary and her child, and he kneeled. Uh, Aitien was convinced that the picture was of Rebecca and Jacob. 
and he kneeled as well, kind of as very typical Chinese courtesy. And he said to Ricci, apparently, according, we only have Ricci's accounts, unfortunately. We don't have, ITN didn't write about it. Ricci wrote about it. He said, he said that he, they usually do not worship um, um, images, but as far as he's concerned, respect to the ancestors is okay. And we'll get back to that point. The Jews of Kaifeng were, by this point, very Chinese, and in, and indeed, did have did uh, revere. They didn't have ancestor worship, but they had uh, in their synagogue a hall for the uh, in honor of their of the ancestors. Big thing in China, uh, uh, honoring your ancestors. There were also pictures of the apostles. There were four. He Itian thought it was the the uh, tribe, the uh, tribes, the sons of uh, Yaakov. He asked where were the other eight. There was some misunderstanding, and after a little bit of discussion, Ricci understood that what he had before him was in fact not an historian but a Jew. He was a little disappointed, but also interested because here's a Jew in China. Nobody had ever heard about uh, Jews in China, and so he. We don't know how uh, Itian reacted if he was disappointed or not, but he left and he did uh, inform Ricci about where exactly they were. Ricci sent a letter to the rabbi of the community of Kaifeng telling them that he had um, not heard but there was a new segment to the Bible and that there, the Messiah had indeed come while they were in China. Um, and the rabbi in a very Jewish and a very Chinese way wrote him back that according to their tradition the Messiah will not come for another 10,000 years. 10,000 is a way in Chinese of saying a lot. He will not come in for another 10,000 years. Uh, but since he was at that time quite old, uh, he was willing to pass on the community to Ricci himself. If Ricci wanted to take on the the rabbinate of Kaifeng Ju Judaism after him, he was willing to give it to him, but he must stop with his abominable practice of eating pork. He had heard that Ricci was a pork eater. It was very, that, that to them, the Chinese, by the way, till this very day, that is the mark of their, of their identity is not eating pork. In a Chinese context, I don't know if you are aware of this, in, in Chinese, uh, when you just, with the, the word meat means pork. Usually Chinese people are e e are pork eaters. That's what they eat. Uh, so not eating pork is a big is a big thing. Uh, he was uh, Ricci never answered the letter, but what we know is that after uh, the rabbi died, uh, the Jesuit were were informed. The Jesuits were informed that, Re that the person who took over after him was his son, who was quite unlearned. And Ricci wrote, at the, as this kind of a side note at the end of this whole description in his book, he said that the, he believed that the community was well on their way to become Mohammedan or heathen. Why am I telling you this story? Because this is 1605. In 1605, they were already quite, how should we say, they were already quite on their way to, to disappearing. Yet, they survived for another 250 years which is quite, it's quite amazing. So what, the, fact that it, the fact that Kaifeng Jews survived at all is really, uh, really pretty, pretty dramatic um, when you think about the fact. And I, I think that one of the reasons it is, in a sense, kind of random. In, in, before, uh, in, the, in the centuries before, during the Ming uh, era, one of the emperors gave the Kaifeng Jews seven names seven family names. And those family names persist till this day. Not all, not all of the clans are still, not all of the um, families are still found. Apparently one of them converted to Islam at a certain point. But of the seven, uh, I believe that uh, at least five or six are, are still uh, around in one way or in one form or another. So I was one of them. I was one of the family names. I Tian was the... Uh, uh, the guy who went, who meant to went, meant, went to uh, meet uh, Ricci, so Mata Ricci. So, in fact, the names were functioned as some kind of identity for a very, very, very long time. 
And throughout the centuries, after Ricci uh, left, uh, passed away, the Jesuits came, kept in touch with this community. They went to visit them every once in a while. We have the, these. The, these are you, you may have seen this at Betat Futsot. This is the model of the Chinese of the synagogue. Uh, here is the uh, 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 sketch of the interior of the synagogue, done also by a missionary, a, a Jesuit missionary who went to visit went to visit the the uh, community. Maybe he wasn't a Jesuit. He, a missionary, a French uh, missionary, who went to who went to visit the uh, the community. They, there was some contact. There was no contact with Jews at this point, only with uh, Christians. Uh, the Christians were very interested in the Kaifeng Jews for among other reasons because um, they uh, were uh, convinced that um, the Kaifeng Jews had very old writings. They, it's a very common misconception to equate remote with ancient. Uh, the Christians were convinced that the Kaifeng Jews had arrived there before, because they were very far, they must be therefore very, very ancient, that they arrived there during the first, after the first temple's destruction, and that therefore they had the original text of the Torah, and in the original text of the Torah, Jesus would be mentioned, you know, the prophecies would be there. In other words, that what we have today is a censored, text of the Torah. They were very disappointed to discover that, in fact, their scroll was exactly identical to Jewish, uh, to the scrolls that they were acquainted with in Europe. Uh, they had this fantasy that they would find evidence, but they were very relentless at trying to get texts. They're trying to buy up texts from the Kaifeng Jews. And the Kaifeng Jews throughout this whole time were persistent at not selling. They did not uh, they, or at least very little there was uh, was given out uh, to the missionaries but the level of knowledge in the community was gradually decreasing there was less and less left as I said there was no contact with outside Jews we know that uh, actually we, th this is fairly old I don't think you can see it here this is just names in Chinese and in in Chinese and in, in Hebrew. So this is fairly late, but we know that the last scroll is written, it's clear that they were just copied and that they, that nobody actually knew how to read Hebrew. Um, I'm talking about 18th century. So I'm jumping to the 19th century. In the 19th century, what happened, 19th century, there was a big crisis in China. And in, in a certain sense, is the story of the Jews of Kaifeng is the story of China. We're going to see it later in the Reform era. But in the 19th century, in 1840, uh, it was the first Opium War, which was a huge shattering for the Chinese because it was the first time they understood that, in fact, they were very, way, way, they were very much behind the, wor the world technologically. They had previously considered themselves the center of the universe. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of the fact the word for China in Chinese is the Middle Kingdom. I've heard that, yes, that is, uh, they were, they're very much under the concept that the, that these foreign uh, barbarians were nothing more than barbarians, that they, they had come to um, pay when they came for trade and so on, which they did under a very strict system, uh, they would come to pay homage to the emperor. I don't want to go into that, to the story of the 19th century too much, but we should say that the 19th century is, was the, the sh usually we start modern Chinese he history from 1840. The Opium War was a big, big crisis. And in fact, with the falling apart of meaning with the crisis of meaning in the Chinese world, the same thing happened to the to the Jews of Kaifeng. There was really very mu not very much left. At the same time, there was also the reason I brought this map is it was also an era of a lot of turmoil. In general, uh, Kaifeng, uh, the synagogue was destroyed a few times. It was destroyed and rebuilt, destroyed and rebuilt because the city sits not far from the Yellow River, which floods periodically and does huge ja damage. It's called sometimes called China's Sorrow, the, the Yellow River. 
Uh, but if you see, I don't have a thing here. Um, that green blotch over there in the center, if you see right above it is Kaifeng. That was a big rebellion. It's, it's kind of far to see, but uh, uh, there were two very large rebellions. Is it this? Oh, yeah, there it is. Yeah. Here we go. The Kaifeng is this dot over here. The reason I'm showing you this map is because the ninth, just to see that the 19th century was really a time of calamity. There was here, there was the, this kind of purpley thing is the, was the Taiping Rebellion. Taiping Rebellion was a huge calamity, cost the lives of per apparently tens of millions of people. Um, the dynasty is starting to fall apart. Uh, this green blotch over here is the, was another big rebellion called the Nian Rebellion. Uh, also caused a lot, a lot of uh, bloodshed and destruction. And basically, by the time we're, we arrive at the, in the mid-19th century, with these calamities, the destruction of the synagogue from a flood in the, uh, at a certain point, and the crisis of meaning in the whole China, throughout China, the community basically ceases to exist. The last synagogue, the last synagogue is destroy, destroyed. The last rabbi dies. There's nobody really to take his place, even in a nominal sense, and the community um, kind of disappears. As I said, it's quite amazing that they survived as long as they did, but that was basically it. Um, the um, uh, in the early 20th century, there was an attempt by Jews from Hong Kong and Shanghai, I think, to uh, contact the remnants of the community in Kaifeng, um, but nobody answered. Uh, there may have been nobody to answer. My father wrote an article in 1987 about the Jews of Kaifeng, which I will return to later, in which he theorizes that uh, that the, it's possible that there were, nobody answered because at that time it was already becoming not so popular to be in contact with foreigners, to have contact with foreigners. China was at that time very anti-foreign for obvious and legitimate reasons. It was in a state of semi-colonialism, abused and divided, and having contact with foreign people was not such a great uh, thing to have, and the Kaifeng Jews uh, didn't, were, were not interested. It's a plausible explanation. We don't know, Could may or may not be. Um, I should say, by the way, kind of as a side note, Kaifeng at this point is already quite a backwater. It was a very important city at the time, but now it's kind of uh, it's kind of the, the sticks, as they say. It's really it's not it's not a very important city. It, even today, it's it's only about a million and a half people, which is very it's not even the pr provincial capital uh, of Henan. Uh, so it's not really a very important place already, and it's quite poor, uh, and it is poor today as well. Uh, so, so the Jews there are really kind of, or the remnants of the Jews, are really kind of fighting for their existence uh, on a day-to-day -day level. Things are pretty bad. Um, I should also say that at this point already, or probably quite a long time before, there are no halachically, there are no halachic Jews. The, the, the community intermarried uh, pretty quickly. Um, Lack of anti-Semitism is kind of helps with that. Uh, they intermarried, uh, and apparently, also apparently, when they they in a in a Chinese way they went according to the father, patrilineal descent. So none of them were Jews at this point, but they did consider themselves names are very important, as I will stress a number of times today. Names are very important in in the Chinese tradition, names and family names. So they had this concept of themselves as Yisraelia, which meant Israel, and later they had the concept Yotai, which meant Jewish. Uh, this is something that they, they didn't really know very much what it meant, but they had this concept that their fathers had came from, come from somewhere else, and they held on to it. I'm jumping now to the, uh, the reason I brought this picture is just, just to see there that throughout the 19th century, Wait, I'll get back to it. Uh, throughout the 19th century, another thing that happened is that any artifacts that were in the city were taken away. All the scrolls, all the, uh, you know, 
Some were bought up by local mosques. Much of it was taken away to Canada, to the U.S., to, to the United Kingdom. So there's really nothing left. The only thing that's left is this hole in the ground where that woman is sitting. That is the well of the Bet Knesset. That's it. That is what there is to see. The Bet Knesset, there's a hospital there now. There's nothing there in the yard. If you pay somebody, you can go and see a hole in the ground. It's kind of a strong metaphor, I think, for the, for the uh, community. There's really nothing left except for a hole in the ground um, in an actual physical sense. I'm skipping over 150 years now. There's 150 years of really not very much happening. Uh, but in the Reform Era, something has reawoken. The Reform Era, let's just say a few words about the Reform Era. Since Mao Zedong died in 1976, uh, or really, to be more accurate, in 1979, Deng Xiaoping opens up China. And uh, it's the beginning of the reform era. Maybe I should preface and say that before the reform era in the Maoist period, anything that had to do with religion and ethnic identity was oppressed. The Kaifeng Jews weren't oppressed because there really wasn't very much to oppress. Uh, apparently, the steels that we saw in the, the, these, these steels were almost destroyed. I met somebody in Kaifeng who apparently saved them and uh, in kind of in the effort to destroy everything old. But you can't really talk about oppression of the community because there was nobody really there to, to oppress. Um, but they definitely weren't talking about their identity because it was not really something that you did. Uh, but in the reform era, we have a blossoming and an explosion of religion in China of every sort of religion. Buddhism is big, you know, fo uh, all kinds of folk religions, the worship of, of uh, you know, Qigong uh, practices. Maybe you've heard of the Falun Gong, another religious movement that in the 90s that was, you know, that uh, popped out of nowhere and had suddenly had 30 million believers. Uh, Christianity is huge in China. Christianity may, possibly may have as much as 100 million believers in Protestant Christianity. Um, which is a lot even in China. Uh, Islam is, is kind of uh, more among the Muslim community, but it's definitely, there's a revival of religion, uh, especially in the province of Henan, where Kaifeng is situated. Kaifeng, Henan is a province that, I just want to show you the cover of this book. This is a book that came out a few years ago called Henan, the Galilee of China, by a missionary scholar by the name of Paul Hathaway. Uh, Henan is considered one of the f centers of of of, uh, of, Chi of Chinese underground Christianity, church house churches, what they call it, Christianity that is not official. We're talking about it's a province that has 100 million people, but we're we're talking about uh, many many millions of Christians, uh, and some of the these Jews are also kind of interested in reviving their identity. At the same time, another process is happening. Not only is religion blossoming, ethnicity is blossoming in China. And part of that blossoming is actually government orchestrated. I want to show you this poster. I should say China has 56 recognized nationalities. And China in the past few years is trying to promote itself very much under the slogan of as a multinational state. We see it here as a poster from it's a few years ago, 2008. Here you see all the ethnic minorities of China in their costumes. And I think the message here is very clear. They're standing here, they're quite small, and in the background is the symbol of power, you know, the, the uh, Beijing, you know, the imperial even one could even say the imperial power they it's a celebration of ethnicity under the auspices of the party and of the state the state is very much present here what it says here is means of Tuanjie means the, the, the unity of the unity of minorities the unity of minorities is uh, uh, what is Putin something like that, the, the, the is infinite uh, happiness or something like that. Uh, very much a celebration of the, if you, some of you may have noticed in the, in the, in the Olympics, in the uh, opening ceremony of the Olympics, it was very present, this kind of 
bringing out these ethnic minorities with their costumes. It's a very much kind of uh, uh, the, the new face of China. It's not just one. It's not just uh, Han Chinese. It's all these ethnicities together, but very much under the guidance of the one the guiding, the, the, I should say, Han Chinese are 92% of the population. So uh, power is very clear. Uh, we can go into that, but maybe maybe later. But with this kind of dual dual uh, trend of religion is in, and ethnicity is in. Uh, religion is interesting and in sometimes. Not always, religion is also oppressed sometimes in China, but it's popular. And ethnicity is in. Um, suddenly, we find that there are Jews in Kaifeng, that people who are kind of, have become re-interested, interested again in expressing their, their, uh, their identity. These are, the, these are the descendants of the community. And now I, I'd like to turn to the second part of this was kind of background, kind of trying to describe what what is there today from my experience and from people people I uh, spoke to and 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 uh, and met. Um, so first of all, as I said, the community was never very large, and I'm sure you, you're wondering about numbers. So I'll say. Not entirely clear, but we're talking about maybe maybe there are about 500 people. There may be, I've heard assessments that say maybe a couple thousand in a kind of a larger circle. But in actuality, the people who, when, when we were there, for example, for the, we were there for Sukkot, uh, so usually for Shabbat, uh, maybe there are about, I don't know, 15 or 20 people for a regular Shabbat in each of the schools. There are two schools. I'll kind of I'll get back to that minute. That in this, why are there two schools? Uh, uh, yeah, it's kind of a, an obvious Jewish Jewish, Jewish thing. But uh, and on Sukkot there were in the, there were ten. There were maybe about 40 people. So we're talking about maybe about 100 people who are really active on a regular basis as kind of a core circle. In the outer circle, maybe a few hundred more. N not very large. Uh, but Kaifeng, I should say, as kind of a side note, is a, is a city where you can walk on the streets, happened to me twice, and people will stop you and say, oh, you're Jewish. You know, uh, we're also, you know, we're also Jewish. You speak Ivrit. You know, I've, it happened to me twice in a period of two weeks. So that's kind of remarkable in a Chinese city where usually people you know have no uh, people have heard of Jews but uh, definitely will have no idea about what that means um, so there are two schools when I mean schools I mean that they're kind of their community centers where people come and learn they learn Hebrew they learn a little bit about the Chagim um, they um, they learn some English and some other things. And they also come for Kabbalah Shabbat, and they have communal meals in their community centers. Uh, there have been teachers coming in and out of Kaifeng. There are a number of organizations working in Kaifeng. And they're mostly individuals, just private individuals coming in and out. The, the organization that is most active there, I believe, is Shavei Israel. It's an organization that is dedicated to uh, work among descendants of Jews, people who are from Mizera Israel. Uh, they're active among the Bnei Menashe in India. If you know, they're active among An Anusim. They're act active among another, a number of groups. They're also active to some degree among among the Jews of uh, Jews of uh, of Kaifeng. As I said, there is nothing to see in Kaifeng. There is basically no there is no artifact. There is interesting when my father wrote the article in 1987 he writes that the municipal government of Kaifeng is excited about building a museum that is no longer that was the case in the 80s that may have been the case in the 80s it's no longer the case they're not excited about it they're kind of more hesitant about it for reasons that I will get to at the end of the lecture I should just say that the museum which has the steels 
is very cheap, like most Chinese museums. But to see the steels, you have to pay another 50 yuan, which is a really a lot of money in Chinese standards. It's, it's strange. It's kind of kept almost uh, kind of far from, uh, it's not emphasized. The, the, uh, you can see, what you can see is this. There's a, a small street where um, uh, it's called the teaching of the, the Torah Lane. See, they wrote it in Hebrew, too. Uh, this is right next to where the Beth Neset used to be. You can go there. It's just a very small alley. There is a young woman who lives there with her family, a descendant of the Zhao clan who was, apparently, they took care of the Beth Neset, who's trying, who has a little museum in her house. She is trying to promote this idea of, she is trying to promote, actually, the reconstruction of the synagogue. It's kind of a sore subject because the community is not really behind her in that uh, effort. Uh, don't want to make too many waves. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, you can see some, here's, there is, I should preface and say, there is, uh, in addition to Shavei Israel, and that's really, the I think, kind of the the new thing about com communities like uh, like the Jews of Kaifeng. Shavei Israel uh, pr helps promote um, orthodox conversion for those who want it. There are, I emphasize for those who want it, it does not go out and try and spread the word of uh, the Torah. It's not a missionary organization, but it does try and for those who are interested, it does try and, and promote uh, conversion. There have been, now, there have been four girls who have already converted, and there are seven seven young men who I taught here uh, who have gone through the process. So there are a few young people who have converted at this point. The older people of the community, or the middle-aged people of the community, are not particularly interested or are not do not seem to be very much um, it doesn't seem that it's uh, so urgent to them to convert. The feeling I got there is that the fact that they're in contact with Jews again, that they're on the map of the Jewish world, that is enough. That for, to, for their, for their uh, purposes, they have, they're Jewish now. They call themselves Jewish. Uh, but it's, there, it's very much an interest of theirs to see the young, young people of the community go through conversion. Now, the reason I say Shabbat Shalom is an is a organization that promotes orthodox uh, conversion is because there are other organizations. And there are other options today. And some of the, apparently in the past few years, some of the younger people of the community have been sent to America, where there are, shall we say, conversions that take less time and possibly less effort. Uh, so they're not the only show in town in a sense. Now, I also mentioned the fact, before I, I return to the issue of what kind of the way they express their identity, I also mentioned the fact that there are two schools. Why are there two schools? I don't want to go into too much into the politics of the community, but what happened is that there, we've, we've seen that from the beginning, missionaries have taken a very strong interest in the Kaifeng Jews. And it's possible that one of the, the first school estab established, I don't want to say for sure, the first school established has had certain contacts possibly with some um, Christians or Jews for Jesus, um, Messianic Jews. That is the background for the fact that there is now a new school which is funded by Shavei Yisrael. Now, this is denied by the person who founded this, the first school, so I don't want to say anything for sure. But I will say that when I met a missionary friend of mine in Yunnan, the first thing he asked me when I went to Kaifeng is, are there Messianic Jews working there? He immediately identified that that's what, that would be the logic, to send a Messianic Jew to work among the Kaifeng Jews. So, and I do know that there was, that there are Hong Kong Christians who have been kind of in touch with the community. I saw even at the house of this woman, uh, which I'll speak about her in a minute, I saw a calendar that they printed, a Jewish-Chinese calendar printed by Christians with things from both the Bible and the New Testament. 
And you can imagine that these people are very, they really don't have a sense of discernment. They, don't, they can't really tell between, I mean, they say we're not Christians at all, we're Jewish, but they can't really tell what is what. So it's very sensitive. That's why Chavez had established this separate school and kind of wanted to cut its ties more or less with the original school. Um, but I should say that when I went to the original school, there was no overt Christian anything there. Uh, that I could see. When I spoke to the people, they didn't seem to have, so I don't know when, if there are missionaries there, when they're willing, when they're planning on, you know, kind of taking the rabbit out of the, out of the hat and saying, oh, you know, by the way, Jesus, um, I don't know if that's ever going to happen or w what the plan is, but so far, there, there's no evidence of it, so, uh, uh, but we should kind of, should remember that, that there is, Kind of, the the orthodox option is not the only option for Jews of Kaifeng. There's Shavei Sleir, there are There's an organization called Kulanu, which you may have heard of. The organization which is much more inclusive. It's more like Jewish ethnicity. Anybody kind of they for them they're not really they don't really promote conversion. It's an organization active among in a lot of places, many places in the world. It used to be the American branch of Shavei Sleir. It's actually a break off. Um, and they're active of Kaifeng, and there's a missionary option, possibly. Um, there are a number of rumors in that in that region. I, maybe some of you have knowledge about that that you can share with me. I, I, I wanted to show this picture. This is a woman I met on the street, and uh, notice this X on her door. This is apparently an old an old tradition about the Jews of uh, Kaifeng to mark the doorposts, a Pesach thing. They have no idea why or what they did it. It somehow evolved into an X on the door at a certain point. I don't really know very much uh, about it. This is one of the only traditions that is left, and this woman did it. Notice this. This is interesting. This is a woman who is of Jewish descent. She's one of, of one of the families, of course not halachically Jewish, but of one of the families. Her husband was not was a Chinese man, not not Jewish descent. And she lived in Shenzhen in the east for many years. When her husband died, this is the gravestone she, she did for him. She doesn't know very much, but she put the, the letters on the gravestone. It's, this is a picture of a picture. It's kind of in bad quality, but you see the Aleph Bet here. She wanted to, to kind of celebrate the fact that she was Jewish. It's strange in a sense because her husband is a very Chinese grave. Her husband was not Jewish, but yet she wanted to it was important enough for her to express her Judaism. She put it on a tombstone, also kind of very Chinese thing, you know, the, the dafka on the on the tomb. Uh, here, this is uh, here's our people. We ate at their house. You must you must know Gao Gao Chao. He's the chazan of the community, and Levana, his wife, from the Jewish from an old Jewish family. I I, I brought this picture to show they have this in their house. Another way of showing. Uh, their kind of affinity and, and relationship to uh, to Judaism. So they are identified. They are very much identified. And they do do their Kabbalah Shabbat every Shabbat. They meet with, I, this is something that I realize, they do that whether I'm there or not. They have their they have their tefillah. Some parts of the tefillah have been translated. They've learned some songs. It's all new. There's nothing that they that they have re retained. The only thing that they've retained from what I have hear from the guys here is that they didn't eat pork, they didn't go and worship in temples, so in a sense they kind of converted to a non-religion, they just kind of, they didn't convert out, they just kind of dropped religion altogether, and they didn't marry Muslims, which is ironic in a sense. I mean, they, they, because, because, they, because it was necessary to differentiate between them and Islam because of the proximity, they didn't marry Muslims, but they didn't marry Han Chinese. So, it's kind of one of the things that you know, identity is a very, very, very fluid thing. Um, the other thing is that many people, I should probably kind of bring things to a close, so a few minutes all. Um, the other thing is that, that many of the people in the community are only married to descendants. And in fact, some of the most active members of the community and most identified members of the community have no relationship whatsoever to the Jewish past. So, again, identity is very, very fluid. They say, yeah, 
I believe Judaism. I have faith in Judaism. What can you say to that? It's kind of a, uh, well, everybody will take it as they, uh, it's, it, but it definitely poses problem for, problems for an organization like Shavay Israel, which is, do you encourage this? You know, how, how, do, how, how it's, this is kind of a new situation uh, for, uh, for the Jewish world in general. You have these people who are genuinely interested in Judaism, one of the members of the community, I should just say, actually was so dedicated that he went and got himself circumcised, even though he's not of Jewish back descent at all. But he said, nobody is going to come to to do to have to give me a giyu. I can't. I can't afford to uh, go anywhere else. And so he just went and done it. Did it. Um, I should also say. I should add this: that Haifeng is a very poor city. And it really, in in many senses, it's a place that looks like it's only recently kind of re joined the current of modernization in China. It's quite gray. It's dirty. It's very third worldish. It looks apparently like the way China looked in the 80s: uh, broken pavements, very polluted. And part of the incentive for people is to get the kids out of there. So there is that there, too. I'm not saying these people are very dedicated. I just want to show you a picture of our sukkah. It's not a very good picture. You can see how gray the city is. Uh, this is on the roof. Uh, this is the sukkah, the gray thing over there. Um, the building of the sukkah on the roof of the building was not really authorized by the, by the, uh, by the landlord of the building. He, in fact, not only was it not really authorized, he said no. But we were lucky, and he was going away. It was just at the time of, of uh, spring festival, of autumn festival, sorry, and uh, New Year's, and he, uh, not New Year's, um, Independence Day, and he went away. And um, we built it and you know, thought, you know, but uh, what was dramatic and was amazing to me is that the, the, the roof was locked, and the members of the community were willing to break the lock, to break in and build it illegally knowing that they could really get into trouble. So they are, I'm just telling you this to, to show that they are very dedicated and that they are, willing, they are willing to do it. It's not a simple thing in China to break the law. Uh, they may have had their ways to get out of it. That's another thing about China. You never know really who's the authority. Finally, we found somebody who su surprisingly had the key and uh, he opened it and we did, we did it and Baruch Hashem, we had... Uh, Real uh, miracle. Nobody, we, the sukkah was there throughout the Chag, and nobody bothered us. But this is just to show that they they really are quite dedicated and willing to do things even out of the box. Not so simple for Chinese. I just want to say a few words at the end um, to um, about state, about the way the state views this uh, phenomena which is kind of, in a sense, is kind of the, cent the, the, the question, the central, the question that's in the background all the time. We should see, uh, see this picture. This is a picture of a Chinese identity card taken out in 1987, quite late. And here it still says Yotai. They still had, they were able to, to, to write in their identity card that they were Jewish. Apparently the clerks there didn't, didn't care. They said Jewish, whatever. Uh, but that is no longer the case. Since the 90s, the Chinese government has made a decision. You have to make a choice. You're either Hui, which means the Muslim ethnicity, or you're Han, but you have to make a choice. There, no there is no Jewish minority in China. As I said, there are 56 nationalities in China. Um, and uh, Judas Judaism is not one of them. Uh, so you have to make a decision. Why the the reason is not has nothing to do with being anti-Jewish uh, in any way. The Chinese government is not anti-Jewish. the 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 story is that the list of ethnic minorities in China is a closed list. When it was compiled in the 1950s, there were over 400 groups that wanted to be recognized as a minzu, as a nationality. The Chinese government do not, does not want to reopen that box. 
once they reopen that box, everybody, you know, there, there's, there are hundreds, as I said, hundreds of groups who would want status. There are all kinds of legal, there's, there's, um, uh, there are all kinds of legal benefits. Uh, being ethnic is in. There are a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of good sides to being ethnicity. There's some negative sides, but generally speaking, in reform era China, being an ethnic minority is rather good. Uh, and not to mention of the fact of the resurgent identity that it can bring with all its, with all its pekalach, they are not interested uh, in in reopening the list of minorities. Therefore, Jews are doing a little bit of Jewish religion within a limited scale. In other words, the schools operate in Kaifeng. Everybody knows there are foreigners there who come and go. Uh, there are foreigners there who stay for a while and teach. They're stationed usually at the, at the University of Hainan there uh, and teach them Hebrew. They're in and out of that school. The authorities know. There's no way that they don't know that those schools exist. And they don't seem to mind. They don't seem to, they seem, seem to um, be fairly kind of oblivion to it, but there are limits in China. Things are, remember, remember this picture. Yeah, this is the, there's somebody watching here. Everything is done within the background of this. This is very nice, all this jubilation and laughing, so, song and dance. The minorities are famous for their singing and dancing, but there is a, an authority. The authority um, will not allow to activity that is beyond a certain scale. So there is talk of rebuilding the synagogue. There is this woman who's trying to, to promote it. If that does happen, it will only be within the state auspices, and it will probably be a museum, definitely not a house of worship. It'll be, if it happens, it'll be a museum and a tourist trap. Um, uh, things are kept very much in kind of a, a delicate, a delicate, uh, delicate control. I'd like to conclude by saying that my my father wrote in that article in uh, that guy in the article in uh, 1987 uh, that he his guess was that the Jews of Kaifeng would become Jews, even though there were no Jews there at the time. He didn't actually visit Kaifeng. Uh, he just spoke to people who had been there. Uh, but his assessment was that the Jews of the West will make them Jews. That's what he writes there. And I think that in many ways that, has, that is happening, indeed. You know, they, they are, in fact, that, that uh, identity label of Yotairen has really returned to Kaifeng. They do identify as such. He says there that, it's not, that he doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to become halachically Jewish, which I really don't see happening in a large scale way. We should also say that there are the problems of the Israeli government. We didn't even speak about that. Converting them is we have problems on our side. It's not so simple. Uh, but uh, definitely, there are, there are no there are not going to be any conversions in China for sure in the near future. That kind of thing doesn't really happen there. Um, um, but they are on their way. Some are converting here, as I said, some of the young people, but they are on their way to kind of rediscovering, re embracing that identity um, for whatever for whatever it uh, for whatever for whatever it, it's worth. But anything that will happen there will be um, slow, gradual, I believe, and, and very much under government's government control. Um, I should say that uh, I was reminded here today that the, the it's actually kind of a, an auspicious day, as the Chinese say, to have this lecture because the seven, the group of seven, uh, seven young men who were at the uh, yeshiva here at Givat HaMiftar are actually going through their conversion today. I was at their Bedin a month ago. This Today they are, uh, it's kind of funny that it was scheduled for today from above, obviously. Uh, they are going through their conversion and, and they're, uh, and uh, we hope that they will be uh, accepted, 
accepted well uh, into uh, into the community here. Not simple to be a, a Chinese Jew with all that. But that that's for that is for a separate lecture. So I think we conclude with that. Should I stand or? Thank you, Gidon, for that. Dan and Harriet were on their way to China. Uh, Dan had been invited, I believe, by the Chinese Academy of, of Social Sciences. And uh, he had consulted a friend of his who knew something about China. And he said, look, they'll all ask you, what's the population of Israel? And he said, lie. <laughs> Tell them it's 25 million. They'll still laugh at you because they won't believe that a country that can make so much noise is only 25 million. But if you say five, they won't even take you seriously. Um, uh, right. Uh, yeah. the seven, David. The seven uh, were converting. Are they staying in Israel or are they going back to their community? Well, yeah, they're staying. They're, first of all, they have to do the army to some degree. Uh, they're all in their 20s, so they have to do at least a little bit. Um, yes, they're stay uh, if they didn't stay in Israel, it would be much simpler, actually. They could do a private conversion. But because they're staying in Israel, they had to do the official, and it's uh, Misad Apneem and everything. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't see any reason why they'll return to... I think one of them actually is thinking of going back and being the rabbi there. But uh, I'm not sure what their plans are in the long term. But for at least... At least for the short term, they're here. Yeah. Hannah uh, Gibbon. I have two questions. The picture that you showed of the woman with the X on her door, there was something white on the right. Some mezuzah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I just wondered about that. Another question um, Is this comparable to other cities, to the Jewish population, uh, the Jewish act activity, comparable to other cities in China? There is no Jewish activity in any other city in China. There are this, the Kaifeng Jews are the only ancient community in China. Um, it's a unique phenomenon. None of the Jews, after the Silk Road was closed in the late 14th century, we don't know what happened to those communities. There were other communities all over China, apparently, Hangzhou and other places, they disappeared. They left. The only Jews in China, except for the Kaifeng Jews, are recent businessmen who are, uh, you know, in Beijing and Shanghai, there are Jews, but they're Western Jews. It's a, it's a different story. They're not Chinese citizens. What about Shanghai? Shanghai has, has non-Chinese citizens, but there, there are foreign Jews who are there doing business. It has a sizable community, but it, it's a different story. It's a story of the relationship between foreign nationals who are being, you know, doing their religious thing. But these people are Chinese. It's, 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 in, as far as the government is concerned, it's a different story. Chabad houses, there are Chabad houses in China, and they function more or less openly. They're not supposed to allow Chinese in, theoretically. It's, supposed to, it's understood that it's only for Jews. But they function in the east, mostly in the east of China. There's a Torah. There's a Sefer Torah. There's a Sefer Torah that is in uh, Canada, I think. I'm not sure where exactly. Uh, yes, there's a scroll and a box and everything. There was a Haggadah uh, that they found. Uh, there's some other documents, uh, you know. No, there was nothing. No, there was. 
No, no, there's no sh as far as I know, there was no contact with the outside. Almost, uh, at least not in the rememberable past, yeah. Okay. Peter, you mentioned that uh, ethnicity is in, but uh, the Chinese are quelling the Tibetans, aren't they? Yeah, some ethnicity is in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and in Xinjiang. Ethnicity, is, it, it's very much in the spirit of the picture. Ethnicity is in under the auspices of Han guidance. In other words, the idea is the Chinese are still hold to the old, to the socialist kind of. There's a, a, a scale of progress. Every ethnic group is is classified according to their stage in their involvement. They're either slave or feudal, or if you remember those Marxist theories, or their and of course the most advanced are the Han. The Han are those who are supposed to guide all the other ethnicities towards socialism, towards the towards the, the future. So it's very much, the problem with the Tibetans and with the Uyghurs is that they're not so much interested in that scheme of things. They want to do their own thing. Uh, so ethnicity is, yes, it's controlled. Uh, is there any uh, university studies that is, uh, courses in universities or in Judaism or with Israel? Uh, yeah, yeah. Chinese academic organization. Um, <coughs> uh, for example, in Kaifang, they have both an, an Israel and a Jewish center. Um, they're very, very interested. They are not allowed, to, uh, whatever that means, to have any contact with the Jewish community. It was a fascinating experience um, you know, to try to. Look, I guess this is your name. I don't want to. No, no, by all means. Um, uh, look, I just uh, spent the last three and a half weeks, uh, or I'm hearing it for about two weeks, running around China and all sorts of cities. There are Israel centers, there are Jewish centers, and uh, with a kippah on, and I had a 21-year-old uh, guy who from birth speaks Chinese who showed Mel Mitzvot with me, also from Washington, D.C. And um, we, shall we say, sort of demonstrated how Jews think, because I'm 63, he's 21, he's a third of my age, and when he didn't agree with what I was saying, we had sort of a Talmudic discussion of sorts. But the goal was to show what the Jewish, how Jews think, because they're obsessed with this, they're fascinated with this. They're obsessed with little Israel. When the first city we went to was a place called Chongqing, which is in southwest China. And um, there are 30 million people in this city. And we tried to explain, look, from all the Jews in the world, you could fit, uh, what is it, like two and a half times all the Jews in this city. Uh, the Chinese had a little difficulty understanding it, just again, as Gidon said here before, in, in, uh, they had a difficulty understanding numbers when you say that in Israel, what, what is in Israel, there are 6.4, who knows what, uh, Jews, million Jews, and that means, um, you know, it's four and a half times of all the Jews of Israel could fit into this city. Um, even though they're studying Jewish things, and they're really very, very interested and fascinated by Israel, it's a little odd. They, they really don't get it. And for example, simply on Kaifeng, which is really what this was all about, and I want to ask please a question if, um, if, if you don't mind. Uh, in Kaifeng itself, uh, we were told uh, by Shavai Israel, we were in contact with Shavai Israel before we went, and we were told, uh, don't tell the people at the university what you're doing. And it was a little difficult because we had all these formal dinners and we said for Kabbalah Shabbat, we explained them we were going to be doing this ourselves. Well, they were right. We were doing, but uh, we weren't doing it exactly the way they um, uh, they said. We went to the first of the two communities. I must tell you, it was both moving and strange. 
uh, they all, of course, don't look like us. Whatever us looks like, they look different. And, uh, you know, as Gidon said here, the um, head of the community was, uh, is not Jewish. He has no Jewish blood in him. There are a lot of, it seems, spouses, men who support their wives, who are very active in this. I don't know what a lot means. You know, Gidon, you know a lot more about the numbers than, yeah. than, than I do. But it was sort of, I want to almost say at times so so uh, so realistic when it came, for example, to Kabbalah Shabbat, they have their sidurim which are in Chinese. There's no Hebrew. And when we came to the Shema, um, you you had people who were saying things, and all of a sudden we hear, whatever. The point is this trope, this tune if it's purely Ashkenazi and it is what Gidon said. These people have nothing historically um, uh, in connection um, with them. Now of the seven families, that uh, the family Jewish names, um, uh, my one of my obsessions in life, um, Shalom and I are, are obsessive genealogists here, and um, I took some DNA samples from the men, the, excuse me, the, whose line are man, man, man. I also have ones whose females and then their mans, it's a lot harder to deal with them and I don't think we're going to learn much from them. But we'll see their, who and what they are because their theories, and please, I am an expert on Islam. I am not an expert on uh, on on the Jews of Kaifang, but how could we not, being in this place for about a week, how could we not um, see them? The first community, I think this guy Tim, which is the, it, it appears to be a missionary guy, not clear. It's not clear. Yeah, it's something is unclear. I was told that something to do with Christians and by them. I wasn't sure what. Anyway, um, he was, you know, he apparently was coming back and forth. There was a guy named Ari that they told me was about to come the next day from the United States. I, you know, I don't really know. But can I just ask one question? On the wall of the first community um, was a letter from clearly in Hebrew, which of course nobody could read except us. Um, from the about the 1840s, from Kulur Shanghai, asking, um, uh, tell us about your community. Tell uh, you know what do you need? What books do you have? What books do you need? Because we'll be happy to supply if we we can. We know nothing about whether there are any answers. No one even know, knew what it was on the wall except they had a picture of this. I don't know, but again, you're you're the expert. I'm just a traveler, so. Anyway, um, I just want to say before I answer your question, something that you mentioned, which is important, I think, kind of to understand a larger context of things. Judaism is very much, as you may have experienced, as you said, is very. It's kind of an exclusive club to belong to in China. For what you can, what you hear from any taxi driver that you meet in China is that Jews are very smart. They have this concept of Jews that is very, very. They don't know any anything, but it's something that really Einstein. Everybody talks about Einstein. I heard it for, for a whole year every day. It drove me crazy already about Einstein. But, uh, but it's uh, but and Marx. Yeah, Einstein and Marx. Yeah, the smart Jews. So it's 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 an exclusive club to belong to that could also explain why people some people are interested in it. Just kind of as a side note, with regard to the letter. Uh, we know there was no answer sent. It was too late. It was too late. There was nobody there who could read. Um, uh, I don't. Uh, yeah, there was. It was. It, it was too late, and things had become very, very difficult by that time. Uh, physically difficult in the community. There was. There was no time for that kind of thing. Uh, so. Yeah, it just uh, it it remains unanswered. If it had come, maybe even fifty years early, it's possible that there was still somebody. Probably nobody read Hebrew for a long time before, but maybe there was enough people. There were enough people who were interested in the contact. But by the time it arrived, it was. Professor Avinari, uh, you mentioned uh, that identity is very fluid, and this is obvious. And my question. Uh, you mentioned that identity is very fluid, and this is obvious. And my question is the following: I mean, we know how they're speaking. You call them community, but let's say people uh, were referred to by the Han Chinese. What was their self-identification when they say they are Jewish or the seven families that have Jewish? What term were they using? They were certainly not using the external Chinese term, which has to do with not eating pork. Do they have a self? 
they were using the word at the beginning they were using when they first arrived they used the the term yisalia how do we know this it's in the it's in the the steels that the, the, it says israelia yisalia actually in a different way than it's written today but it yeah it's a a transliteration yisalia that was the name that they used uh that we know for sure i don't know and i'm sure somebody does know when the term yotai came in because we know that itn when he met matteo ricci was not aware of that term he knew yisalia he didn't know yotai uh, yotai is again the transliteration of ud um Yes, those are the terms they use, and in many senses, that was all they know. They knew was that term. Uh, the kids, the the boys I spoke to here, didn't know anything about uh, a god when they when they were growing up. Uh, all they knew was that name, the family names, and the pork prohibition, which was not even necessarily observed by the time they. And they uh, grew up, but they knew that they bought from Muslim butchers, or at least tried to buy food from Muslim butchers, but didn't marry their daughters. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, first of all, um, I identify myself, David Parsons, with the Christian Embassy next door, mm -hmm. and I think our Taiwan branch. Uh, made a donation for the studies of these seven students recently to Shave Israel. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also involved with uh, bringing the B'nai Menashe cooperating with Shave Israel for that. We've just sponsored the first group to come. And my question is, uh, have you come to some conclusions about the apparent connection between the B'nai Menashe? Did they come out of the Kaifong community centuries ago? I'm not an expert, to be honest. Uh, I don't see any evidence of that, really. But the problem with the B'nai Menashe is, of course, we have no written history before the 19th century. So th there's really, it's all oral. So the question is, what place you give to oral history? And that's kind of more of a, almost a personality thing. You know, it's a, a different historians tend to give more emphasis to oral, oral uh, histories than other. I, I, I don't know, but I don't, I, I don't see any direct evidence to the Kaifeng Jews. And in fact, I don't think that they claim, because, I mean, the narratives are totally different. The, one is that it's a ten lost tribe, the Menashe, and the Kaifeng Jews do not claim to be the lost tribes. They claim to be Jews who came from Persia and from Central Asia. So I don't, I don't see any connection necessarily. I have a different kind of question. Does it relate to the Kaifeng Jews? or to Jews so much as it relates to China itself. Um, I've read recently that China has a vast eugenic program, a vast eugenic program, and they actually sterilize many people who they consider inferior, and their great respect for Jews and their intelligence is because of their own massive program to develop a superior uh, intelligence society which will dominate the world. What do you think? Do you think that's nonsense or do you think it's uh, does I think it's pretty to close to nonsense. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, no, no I'll, I'll be I'll be honest. I mean, I think that it's I think that it's it first of all, I'll say a few levels. It has nothing to do with the popular level uh, uh, feeling towards Jews. The popular level feeling towards Jews, I mean, in other words, the man in the streets just knows that Jews are very smart. He doesn't know anything more about Jews. It, it, it's interesting, the Chinese, what they like about Jews is what they like about their own tradition that much of it has been lost. In other words, their, 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 their emphasis is on education, uh, family. These are all Confucian ideals, which the Chinese have lost, and they recognize in the Jews, it's basically their longing for their own tradition in many ways. So that I think that is that's the really the, the popular level. What happens on the on the government level is something that I don't think we really know about. I don't know about the eugenics program. I, I'm, I'm maybe you maybe you've read something I haven't. I don't think the Chinese usually and and historically don't think in racial terms. That's very un-Chinese. Chinese think in cultural terms. People can be cultured. People can become, th that's again the emphasis on education. P 
people people are raised from a very young age. Children are always educated from the age of nothing. They're educated, educated, educated. The, the emphasis is on Chinese believe that man is born good. That is what was one of the big points of contentions with Christianity, and that man can self-cultivate himself. So it's very, very, it's very ingrained the educational concept, not so much a racial concept of racial blending. And we see that throughout history, peoples, all kinds of barbarians, became Chinese because because Chinese was about becoming begot, 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 it was about culture. It wasn't about race so much. So this kind of eugenics thing sounds to me like a deviation. From the gen, from the, from the, does it exist? Possibly, I don't know, but I don't think it has anything to do with the Jewish thing. That's my feeling. Yeah. Okay, I'd be happy to read it. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Uh, there's a very old joke about the American tourist who is in Kaifeng, and he goes on Shabbat to the synagogue, and the guy comes up to him and he says, uh, "You Jewish?" And he says, sure. And he says, funny, you don't look it. It's not a joke. It happened to his grandparents. OK. <laughs> they were in China. They were also, I suppose, you really are Jew? You don't even look Jewish. <laughs> OK. My grandparents? Yeah, Nettie and Alfred. They were in China. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other, th yeah, the other thing I wanted to say was that uh, that in in the in in the Far East in general, there are small Chinese communities who are always at the top of the tree in terms of uh, e economic and other achievements, and they were known as the Jews of the East. Um, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, th th that's another th that's another affinity that they like to find. Another similarity they like to find between themselves and 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 Jews. They have a diaspora. And their diaspora is very successful, and it's uh, it kind of works in a similar way, to a certain extent, to Jewish diasporas. These are families; fa it's very family-based, and they're very. They usually, in fact, it's true that they are in, in places like Malaysia, for example. They are the backbone of business, uh, of finances. Uh, the Chinese. There's also a city in China. There's a city called Wenzhou. Uh, a, m with a, a lot of Christians, which is called the Jerusalem. They're also called the sorry. They're not the Jews. They're called. They're also called the Jews of China, because they're very very good at business. Yes, they have. That's another. That is another uh, thing that they. I mean, that's kind of the other side of this talk about you know Jewish intelligence. Is you know the the, the, the they have this concept of Jews as being very very good at finances. I would always say to them, you know, and that I'm sorry that nobody told me. Nobody told me the secrets about Jewish finances, I was kind of left out. I don't know how, how the secret didn't get to me about how to, you know, how to be, uh, how to make money, but uh, they're, 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 they're very convinced that, that that's, that's a big, that's you a big thing. You obviously don't have any Chinese blood, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very, very much, Gidon. I think uh, we all gained <laughs> tremendously, and uh, we look forward to hearing you again at JCPA.